My name is Jordan Palmer. I'm 35 years old. Today is June 10th, 2011. We're in Lexington, Kentucky. I'm here with my friend and colleague, uh, Josh uh, Koch. I'm the president of Kentucky Equality Federation, and he's the public relations and media director. My name is Josh Cuck. I'm 30. Today's date is June 10th, 2011. The location is Lexington, Kentucky, and I'm here with Jordan Palmer. He's my friend and colleague at Kentucky Equality Federation. Okay. Josh, um, where were you born? I was born in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Okay. Is that where you grew up? Yes, it is. Did you spend most of your life there? Yes, I did. What was it like? Well, it was a, it was kind of an interesting situation. Um, the Lehigh Valley, which encompassed three major cities, Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton, was a pretty ethnically diverse lo uh, locale. It was outside, about an hour outside New York City, 10 minutes from New Jersey, an hour outside Philadelphia. Um, half of my family was Pennsylvania German, which was a fairly dominant ethnic group there in the past. And it, it was it was interesting. I got exposed to a lot of things from a very young age. What were your parents like? I I had a very complicated and difficult relationship with my parents. Um, while I, I do love them dearly, uh, we do disagree on a number of things, um, child rearing being one of the key disagreements. However, uh, they were very involved in Republican politics. They were very involved in uh, church growing up, especially fundamentalist and charismatic churches. And that's what I grew up with. That's what I was used to. And I, I had a very difficult time growing past some of the ideologies and programming that came out of a background like that. Can you remember a specific time where you struggled with that as a child? I can. It, it was it was really difficult um, looking back on the situation to pick out one instance. If I, if I had to pick out one of the formative instances where I really began to understand that something was wrong, it was that there were certain members of the family at that point only wanted it come out but it was something that never was talked about. And if it was made reference to, there was an implicit and at, at sometimes explicit fears were put inside our head that because somebody was of a different sexual orientation, they were probably likely to go after one of us as kids as a partner. I mean, looking back on it now, it, it it's highly offensive and it's tragic that that happened, but that's the kind of... That's the kind of environment that it was. So a member of your family came out as... Gay. As gay. And what do you mean by that? Um, were they threatened by your family or were they just shunned by your family? The, well, they weren't... There were two branches of the family. One mindset was openness about it. it even at that point, it wasn't... They weren't friendly to the concept, but they weren't hostile to it either. They just accepted it for what it was, never referenced it by name. Um, it was just always implied. I had an uncle. His partner was like an uncle to me. I, I loved him dearly. He was very helpful to me growing up. However, within my immediate family, my parents several times made reference to the fact that they thought that because they were not like us, if you will, that was the terminology that I remember being used, that there was always the danger of lurking in their minds that them, one of them might go after one of us as an underage partner, which was completely unfounded. But Like to molest you or something? Yeah, exactly so. How did that make you feel? It really bothered me because I knew both of them really well. They were really friendly to me growing up. They were always there for me. And it bothered me that in my family that anybody would be trying to actively turn me against another member of my family. At that point, I still subscribed to uh, the socially conservative doctrine, the church fundamentalist doctrine. However, 
even then, even believing all that, I still knew that these people were not bad people. They were good people. Uh, they had been there for me. They were, they were important in my life, and it it hurt to see them, to see that aspect of their lives being exploited to force me to distance myself from them. They did force you to distance yourself from them. They tried, and that gradually abated over the years. However, it it made a huge impression in my early teen years. Do you have contact with your uncle now? I do sporadically. Do you did you have any siblings? Yes, I did. I had a younger sister, Allison. She was two years younger than me. How did she feel about it? It bothered both of us, but honestly, there were so many other things going on. Um, I'm not sure how best to say this, but we had a very difficult childhood, and she took the brunt. Uh, toward the later years, she took the brunt of the things that were done. It, it was, it was a strict very strict family and there were things that were done that uh, affect us even to this day do you care to elaborate on what that exactly that means well they were they were of the belief that anything goes in child rearing and there were, there are a lot of details of that that I would care not to go into but it made an impression, and I know it's taken me a long time to get over them, and I know that she struggled with things as well from our childhood. In general, maybe you could tell the listeners and um, for our website what your definition of child-rearing is. My definition of child-rearing is probably more traditional. I believe that you need to be firm. You need to teach children the basics. You need to teach them not to steal, not to lie, not to cheat, not to attack each other, not to be rude, but to be well-mannered. However, my variation is I, I don't believe that it is the parent's role to define a child, and that honestly was their role. That was their goal growing up was to define us and form us in a way that we would follow on the path that they thought was proper. I don't necessarily agree with that that perspective at all we are all here for our own purposes we all have a mission we're not here by accident i do still firmly believe <clears throat> that god had a has us here for a reason but i don't think that that reason can be defined by uh, a model that's defined by men i think it's up to each of us to find it within ourselves yes absolutely i agree how would you describe yourself as a child? Were you happy? No, I was not happy. I was generally very isolated. Um, it, it was not an easy childhood. I was homeschooled. Academically, I, I came out much much better than many of my peers. However, as far as uh, socialization, understanding how the world worked, I look at the period before I was 18 as a dark period. I I was not allowed to socialize freely, especially in my later teen years. Um, it, w it was difficult to make the adjustment. <clears throat> Why were you not allowed to, ice, to, to socialize? Well, one of the main reasons was the guiding mindset <clears throat> in, in my raising years was that if I was allowed to freely associate with people my own age, that I would be corrupted by the vices of the world. Now, you have to understand that this included anything that was not Christian and specifically anything that was not fundamentalist. For instance, if I was caught listening to secular music, that was a punishable offense. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I had things destroyed. I, there, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of baggage that came out of my growing up years, and a lot of it was oriented around creating two children who would follow exactly in my parents' footsteps in this fundamentalist sort of mentality. So did you have any friends at all when you were growing up? Did you I, have a best friend? I did. Um, and I do still have friends that I keep in touch with from back then. Um, most of the ones that I've kept in touch with were, were friends from a local homeschooling group. Do you have a, a best memory of your childhood? 
I do. My best memory uh, from my childhood, I'd have to say, was being around family. Um, I remember... I remember I used to love going out to my aunt and uncle's farm and being with my cousins. Because, like I said, I I was fairly isolated. But I remember I, I loved my cousins. I loved being around them. And those were those were pretty much my happiest times growing up. And being around them gave you comfort, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. Do you call your worst memory in your childhood? My worst memory in my childhood... I don't know how... Come here. It's okay. My worst memory in my childhood was that the first person who held a knife to my throat was not a stranger. And I was nine years old. What impact do you think that that's had on your life? It had a really dramatic impact because as soon as I left the house and, uh, I mean, there was no transition period. I went from this growing up period to to the military. And honestly, I couldn't wait to get out. I was, when I hit 18 and I graduated high school, I wanted to go away. I didn't want to stay in the Lehigh Valley. I didn't want to stay in Pennsylvania. I wanted to get out. I wanted to go as far away as possible and leave all of that behind me. And I did things that I'm not really proud of when I was in my early adulthood. Um, I ran wild. I wanted to break out of it. I wanted to put it all behind me, and I, I tried to escape it and erase it from my mind and just put it away. And I did some things that I really wish I hadn't done, and none of it helped. And when I started to get my life back together, I thought... Maybe I'd been wrong. Maybe I was crazy. Maybe they were right all along. And I went back to what I knew. I went back to the church. I went back to living the square life, if you will. What age did you do that at? I was 22, 23. And I I thought by going back to this, I could find my way. That I'd realized that running away from things was not the way was not my way out but I thought that going back to Republican involvement church involvement going back to those kinds of things would help me find an answer I mean my real changing point was when I tried to commit suicide at the age of 21 because I realized that running away wasn't going to help and after that I went started going back to church but I couldn't find one that I felt comfortable at I went back to mainline denominations I went back to fundamentalism I tried to find something there, and there wasn't anything there. And honestly, I was in limbo by the time I hit 25. I was, I was kind of lost. I tried everything. I tried to go back to what I knew. That didn't help. And then I was doubly confused because I knew running away wasn't going to help, and I knew that going back to what I knew wasn't going to help. And I wasn't sure where to turn. And it's about that point that I, through a sheer stroke of luck, um, encountered some really, really good people. They were, the one that stands out in my mind, his name's Rob. And he made it clear that he was gay. He'd gotten married to his partner in Vermont. He was a libertarian. And he he used to call me out regularly on, on idiosyncrasies that I would have. Situations where I would, quote, what, I, what I'd grown up with. And he'd say, but you, you're smarter than that. You know you know that's wrong. And he'd confront me, confront me, confront me. And he forced me to realize that maybe, maybe this new return wasn't for me either. And he, he would stop me and he'd say, look, you need to start thinking these th- for yourself. You've got, you've got the basic understanding here, but you need to look objectively at, at these things. And he was really the first person to objectively confront me and convince me that maybe I needed to stop running, maybe I needed to stop looking for a solution, maybe I needed to look objectively at every situation and quit taking all this all this stuff that had been programmed into me. 
and it, and it really took several years for me to deprogram from all the programming that I'd got as a, gotten as a child to finally stop running, to think objectively about these things. And I'm grateful to him, quite honestly, because if he hadn't confronted me, I'd probably still be wandering in the wilderness. So that's when you started to think for yourself and to question things? Yes. I mean, I had the advantage growing up that I read a lot of the great books. Um, my favorite philosopher is Socrates. He was questioning everything. He never claimed to know anything. He would question. He would ask questions. He was inquisitive. And all along, I realized that the answer was sitting right in front of me. Which is what? The fact of the matter is, there is no textbook, there is no holy book, there is no writ that is going to carry all the answers to life. Each of our lives are different. We're all here for different purposes. A lot of people will not ever discover their purpose because they've been so programmed. I'm only here because I've had the good fortune, and I think God has looked out for me and made sure that I would run into somebody who would wake me up from my sleep. We've got to start questioning these things, and above all, we've got to look objectively. You can't, when you're looking at people that are suffering, when you're looking at people who are disadvantaged, you can't quote a textbook at them. That's not going to help them. If somebody's starving, quoting a chapter and a verse at them is not going to help. I and mean, that was Jesus' message all along. Your actions speak louder than words. If you know somebody's suffering, it doesn't matter whether you like them. It doesn't matter whether you like their lifestyle. It doesn't matter what choices they've made in the past. The fact of the matter is all we've got is each other. And if we don't help each other survive, what do we have? We've got a bunch of empty books and a bunch of broken lives. Come a long way. Yeah, I have, and I've got a lot further to go. Why do you feel like you have a lot further to go? Because I've come to understand this is a journey. It's not an objective. You don't if you don't eventually reach a point in your life where you can stop growing. Because if you do that, you die. Yeah. It's kind of like it's kind of like success. It's a journey, not a destination. Exactly. If you think you've already reached it, something's wrong. So, do you still have contact with your parents? I haven't been some time. I do sporadically make contact with them and vice versa. Hmm. I have that in common. I don't I haven't spoken to my father in, except for briefly recently in 15 years. So, you have children of your own. Yes, I do. How many uh, children do you have? I have three of Michael, Tristan, and Gretchen. And how do you raise them as compared to the way that you were raised? Well, I, I definitely don't use the strict methods that were used on me. I, I work with their wife, or my ex-wife, their mom. Um, I want to raise them as stable, thinking people. They need to think for themselves. They need to have their own identities. There are some basics that we all need. Um, respect for property, respect for people. But they're not going to be raised in the fundamentalist method that I was raised. They're going to be exposed to a lot of things that I was not exposed to until later in life. And I'm not going to try to make all their decisions for them. How would you react if one of your children came to you one day and said that they were bisexual or lesbian or gay? I would accept them. That would be the right thing to do. I love them nearly. It doesn't make them any less or more of a person. I might have to lean heavily on the other ones to make up for the grandchildren, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll worry about that when it happens. So you, you joined the military at what age? I joined the military fresh out of high school the first time. I attended the Naval Academy uh, for a semester. I got sick during finals. My grades bombed. I had to leave. I went back out in the working world. Um, got really, really bored. I was looking forward to a career in the military, so I enlisted in the Marine Corps Reserves. And you're active. 
it was active reserves. I had stints where I'd get called up for duty and training, but I was still on the reserve status. Currently, what is um, your... I'm, I got out for a year and a half and then went back into the Army National Guard down here in Kentucky. To the Kentucky National Guard or the Army National Guard? The Kentucky Army National Guard. And what is that like for you? It's challenging. There are, there are a lot of changes going on that I can't, the technical ones I can't go into. However, it's, the culture's changing. Um, Do you enjoy the work? I love the work. I absolutely love the work. It's networking, uh, computer work. I, I, that's my bread and butter. That was the one, <laughs> the one thing I've kept, kept up with over all these years. So that's one thing in life you can definitely point to and say that you've achieved for yourself and that you you love doing it. Yes, I do. It's also offered great opportunities. I got to go down to the inauguration in 2009. I got to help with the hurricane recovery in 2008. Got to help with the ice storm recovery in 2000. I guess that would be 2009, right before the inauguration. Or right after the inauguration. It's been exciting. Yeah. Which inaugurations are you talking about? Uh, President Obama's inauguration. Okay. And you said that you were homeschooled as a child. Were you always homeschooled, or did you ever attend public or private schools? The only school I attended outside of being homeschooled was a preschool. <laughs> that that was the only outside schooling I had. I attended one computer course when I was at a local community college when I was about 10 years old. It actually got me interested in programming, and I followed that as a hobby for many years now. You're the immediate vice chair of the Libertarian Party of Kentucky, correct? I was. What was that experience like for you? It was challenging. It, the climate for third parties in Kentucky is not healthy at all. Uh, there is a concerted effort by the Democratic and Republican parties to keep independents and third parties off the ballot to keep us from being able to involve be involved in the in the electoral process at all and a lot of the laws that are written people don't fully understand what do you mean by when you're talking about ballot access well, what do you talk i don't understand what you mean well ballot access <clears throat> is the ability to get a candidate on the ballot for instance if the democrats and the republicans want to get a gubernatorial candidate to run all they have to do is get two signatures on a petition however if i'm going to get a candidate to run. I have to get 5,000 signatures to run. And actually, I have to get more than 5,000 signatures because they will immediately contest the petition and try to get the number knocked down through the contesting process down below 5,000 and then remove the candidate from the ballot. You're talking about independents. Independents, third parties, anything but Democrat and Republican. Hmm. Do you think that that's something that most, Kentuck most Kentuckians are aware of? Oh, I highly doubt it. Even most legislators and elected officials don't know. I actually got to meet with Trey Grayson last year, the outgoing, or he's gone now, the Secretary of State of Kentucky, and he, I asked him point blank, why, why the 5,000 number? And he said, well, it seems completely arbitrary, but he, the fact is, even in his position, it wasn't something that was front and center for him. It, it didn't attract attention. Even as the chief elections officer of the Commonwealth, it wasn't it, something that was front and center it's, of them. It's amazing. Um, so many people just take these things for granted. This is the way it's all, always been done. The fact of the matter is it's not the way things have always been done. If you look at the 1800s, there were a lot of third parties floating around until the early 1900s. However, when the Democrats and Republicans decided that competition was bad for business, they slowly and steadily started building this wealth of legislation that does not provide free and equal election access to all citizens. Do you find any historical irony that the Republican Party was founded to be progressive by ending slavery and now that it's, it's taken a complete turn? Well, the, the Republican Party is a party of contradictions, and this is something that has come to my attention. It is highly ironic that it was started to, to free the slaves. However, at the time, there were, a, there were a lot of different social and economic strains that required them to take that position uh, for their own benefit. However, if you, 
if you look at analogous situations, while at the time they were able to call on religious roots for their beliefs, they're using exactly the same or exactly the same basis through a different uh, different paradigm to oppose equality now. Oddly enough, it's a sword that cuts both ways. Now they've been taken over by the, uh, at least a certain faction has been taken over by the fundamentalist Christian uh, right, and they use the Bible to prevent equality and prevent support of equality. And you believe in equality? I do believe in equality. Obviously, or you wouldn't be with <laughs> Kentucky Equality Federation. True. Um, what is your first memory uh, of me? My first, <clears throat> my first memory of you was one of the early conversations that we had about a local uh, state house candidate, and the situation that had arisen was we were running a candidate. You were running a candidate's campaign who was running against absolutely one of the strictest social conservatives in Frankfurt. And the one thing that really stood out to me was you were, matter of fact, you were business-oriented. I'd met the candidate before. The candidate had impressed me up in Frankfurt at a rally, actually against anti-equality legislation, about a year before. But it was business-like. It wasn't emotional. It wasn't um, it was an arbitrary calls on fairness. It was actually, you had a plan, this was the plan, you were very businesslike, organized, and focused. And that was the first time in a long time that I'd been approached to do something with such a direct plan that's so explicitly laid out and well, well thought out. How would you describe me? I'd describe you as a a great friend, a uh, confidant, um, a visionary, because you look at this fight for equality objectively, not emotionally. I mean, it is an emotional issue for you, but you're a realist, and you're willing to make the sacrifices necessary to accomplish the ends that we all seek. So when you're talking about equal ballot access and equality in the Commonwealth of Kentucky... Where do you think we'll be in 10 years? Well, it depends. If this gets to a federal court, it's obviously going to get resolved pretty quickly because our laws our laws in Kentucky don't are, are not in compliance with Supreme Court decisions. In what way? They have arbitrary standards, completely arbitrary standards. There's no mathematical formula. There's no there's no way that they can back up the standards that they've got. For instance, if you want to run a congressional candidate in one district, you have to get 600 signatures. If you flip that around, there are six districts in Kentucky. By theory, for a statewide race, you should have to collect 3,000, assuming that 600 is a fair number, which I debate. However, for a statewide candidate, instead of 3,000 signatures, you actually have to get 5,000. Secretary of State Trey Grayson said it was an arbitrary number. He couldn't understand why it was picked. These arbitrary, these arbitrary regulations do not provide constitutionally guaranteed free and equal ballot access. They're going to have to be fixed. And the free, if, and the free and equal ballot access is not guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution. It's not a federal question, is it? It can be. Ohio has actually lost... Ohio had their ballot access regulations struck down. The, the, there is precedent, and it's growing, and we're not going to be satisfied with taking no for an answer. I agree with that, that we're not going to be satisfied in taking no for an answer. And what about for equality? Where do you think that we'll be in 10 years from today? What I earnestly hope is that for equality, that we're going to be able to win this battle not just in Frankfurt, but across the state. We have to stop looking at each other as labels. I'm straight, you're gay, I'm black, you're white. All these labels, all these categories, all this pigeonholing and organization of people is wrong. If I run into somebody on the street, they're not, 
whatever the sum of their demographic information is. They're a human being that has value. And honestly, we can win all the battles we want to in Frankfurt. But until we grow to the point where we can look at somebody and judge them, like Dr. Martin Luther King said, on the content of their character, not on what their outward appearance is, or in today's day and age what their demographic information is, we're not going to have won the fight. We need to stop looking at each other as enemies. We need to stop looking at each other as catalog items. But his widow, Coretta Scott King, said that struggle is a never-ending process. It is. You have to win it with each generation. Yes. Just like freedom. Yes. So, would you say that um, you have a love of your life? Or have had a love of your life? That's a complicated question. (laughs) Do you want to dodge that question? I do. It's fine with me. When did you first fall in love? (sighs) It's a really complicated question. Um, How old were you? When I had my first crush? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I was probably 13. But you probably weren't able of it. Were you able to pursue it because of... Oh, God, no. No. So, um, when did you first find out that you would be a parent? Tell me how that made you feel. It it was actually a real shock. I was <clears throat> living in Indiana with my ex-wife, and it was a really challenging situation. We were struggling. She was in her senior year of college, and we were not married all that long. We'd been married about nine months at the time, and it was it was really, really shocking. I was not expecting to be a parent. I didn't feel ready at all. I didn't feel prepared at all. Did you feel worthy? No. I didn't know. At that point, I was still wandering in the darkness. As far as I was concerned, I I was afraid to raise a kid because of what I'd gone through growing up. But how did you feel the first time you saw your child for the first time? I loved him to pieces. He was amazing. <laughs> he was so funny and cute. and He was just awesome. I, I loved him to death. And did that change when you saw your first child for the first time? Did that change your outlook on the world? It did because I realized that I had to get my act together. I had to figure out where I was going and what I was doing. Because what a lot of people don't realize, and it took me a while to realize it, was that this world that we have, we don't live all that long. Our lifespan is, what, 80 years if we're doing well. But the fact of the matter is as soon as you have the next generation on deck, as soon as they start arriving... The story is no longer about us. It's about what kind of world you're going to leave because at some point you're going to die and at some point this child is going to have to face the world that's out there. And somewhere in between, you're going to have to be able to look at that child and say, look, here's what's right with the world, here's what's wrong with it, here's what I've done. And I hope that you can fix what I wasn't able to get done in my lifetime. And that is a really shocking fact to have to take at face value. Do you think that you are preparing your children for that life? I hope so. I want to. They're still quite young. So I'm I'm very hopeful that that will be the case. So tell me what brought you from the journey from being such a fundamentalist as far as your religion and growing up with your parents to believing in equality for people and that brought you, and we're honored to have you, uh, to Kentucky Equality Federation because I asked you as soon as you had left the office as vice chair of the Libertarian Party of Kentucky. The biggest realization that I had was that I was afraid. And it was part of the whole programming process. We were taught to be afraid. We were taught that unless we were on the straight and narrow path that we were going to hell. And that if we affiliated with anybody who wasn't on the straight and narrow path, and I use that pun because it fits, 
Did you, you feel that way when you first met me? <clears throat> no. No, but honestly, when I started first affiliating with people who were of other um, sexual orientations, I did. I struggled with it. I, I didn't know what the problem was. I knew they were normal people. I knew they were good people. I knew they were very intelligent, thoughtful people. But I didn't know what the problem was, and it took me a long time to realize it was about my own fear. It was combating all this programming that had been shoved into me from a very young age. Even when I didn't believe it anymore, the fear stays with you. And the fact of the matter is, once I got over the fear, there wasn't a problem anymore. I don't think I'm going to hell because I affiliate with anybody of any orientation. I mean, look at... The biggest realization I had was looking at Jesus' ministry. He was here for three years. Three years of active ministry that made a difference in the entire span of humanity. Well, who did he affiliate with? He, he affiliated with the outcasts of his, his society then. He didn't like the establishment people that he was with. They were the ones that killed him. He didn't have fear. So why is it that 2,000 years later, the people that are operating supposedly in his name are programming their children to live in fear? We should be reaching out we have elected officials people. that are running for constitutional office this very year and all the time, even Kentucky representatives and Kentucky senators that do that, as yes. you're aware. Yes. Yes. Do you know, I mean, I'm a very religious person and spiritual person and I also practice doism, um, but do you recall and do you know what the greatest commandment of all is that Jesus gave his disciples? It was love God and love your neighbor with all of your heart and all of your soul. Yep. Yep. And that gets forgotten. That gets glossed over. Instead of loving people, we hate them. We question them. We question their motives. We wonder if they're going to get us sent to hell because we're affiliating with them. I mean, we have become the Pharisees and the Sadducees of the 21st century. And it's high time that we woke up and realized it. I agree with you. How did it make you feel when I asked you to... Um, become a volunteer and a director um, charged with public relations, a special political consultant, and our media director with Kentucky Equality Federation. I was a bit off-put by it at first. Um, I've never done issue advocacy before, <laughs> and this is different from anything that I've ever tried before. I've tried working with a political action committee. I've tried get-out-the-vote campaigns. I've tried working with two political parties now. I've never actually cut political ties and just said, hey, you know, I'm committed to this cause. It's a long-term cause. It's going to last more than one election cycle, and it's nothing short of a full-fledged civil rights movement. Um, it, it was an exciting opportunity, but I, it was not something that I was prepared for or familiar with, and I honestly didn't know if I'd be adequate to the task. Do you feel like you are? I hope so. I feel like you are. I have complete confidence and faith in you. Otherwise, I would have never asked you. I've never doubted you ever or your potential. Um, even from the first day that we met, I've never doubted your potential and what you're capable of when you set your mind to it. That's why I asked you uh, to join the organization because I think that you can help us reach people that we otherwise could not reach. And you have a very unique perspective as you've shared here with us. And that's the entire reason that I asked you to join the organization. Um, and I'm very, very proud to have you with the organization. And I want you to know that. Um, is there any other thing that you would like to share uh, as we're wrapping up? Yes. I would, I would like to reach out to the people who, especially in my generation, who are stuck in the fundamentalist rut who know the right thing to do is to reach out to the LGBTI community, members of different races, members of different parties, who know, who have friends, who sympathize quietly and that are afraid. I've been there. I know what you're going through, and I know why it haunts you. There is a bigger, broader world out there. You are called to a higher purpose than to sit in a pew or vote for a certain Republican or Democratic party. Think for yourselves. If you know people who are being abused, if you know people who deserve your love and care, 
reach out to them. Don't be afraid to reach out to them because that's a higher calling. And I'd like to thank you, Jordan, for inviting me to Kentucky Equality Federation and the Story Corps. Uh, I hope I can live up to the expectations. I'm really excited to be part of this effort. It's one of the most important callings that you can be involved in. Yeah, we're going to have you here for a long time, I hope. Excellent. Yes. All right.